Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Stani, who is the founder of Aave. Aave is one of the big lending markets on Ethereum and now also other chains. But before we talk with Stani about Aave, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. Our first sponsor is Stake Wallet. Stake Wallet is a is, is a new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet that puts the power of Web3 at your fingertips. In just a few taps, you can stake and manage your assets on over 22 built-in protocols, including all major EVMs, L2s, and non-EVMs like Cosmos, Solana, Nia, Arbitrum, and more. Just recently, they've integrated 3Tap, Liquid, Matic, and Solana staking, as well as Liquid AVAX, and launched support for NFTs on Polygon and Avalanche. With more integrations being added every few weeks, jump into the Discord to let them know what you'd like to see on their roadmap. Don't forget to check out the Explore section in the app for your daily fix um, of the hottest steps, yields, and news across chains. Download Stake Wallet today on iOS or Android at stakewallet.fi, and uh, Stake is spelled like the meat. We're also brought to you by CowSwap. So DEXs are great, but they're vulnerable to problems like MEV, failed transactions, and high gas costs. CowSwap tackles these issues head on and offers a new kind of trading experience. Built by Gnosis, CowSwap is a meta DEX aggregator. That's right, it's a DEX aggregator aggregator. It fights MEV by matching overlapping orders directly. If no coincidences of wants are found, that is where the cow comes from, trades are settled on a variety of underlying on-chain AMMs, depending on which pool offers the best price. And CowSwap has recently celebrated its, its first year anniversary, so it's one now. And over this exciting year, CowSwap has accomplished a total of 10 billion trading volume and uh, 2,500 different tokens traded. And it's generated a total of um, $50 million surplus for its users. It's also moving the decentralization forward. So um, there was a successful vote on CIP7 in the CowDAO, and external solvers can now be included in the allow list um, and can uh, win uh, badge settlements. Our last sponsor is Teleho. Teleho is redefining the wallet as a public good. You can think of it um, as a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. So with Tallyho, you can enter the Metaverse with a Web3 wallet that's um, fully community-owned and operated, and it's the first wallet that is also a DAO. Tallyho's commitment to community ownership and public goods stretches beyond the wallet. In January, they became the first sponsor of Ether.js, an open-source JavaScript library helping developers connect to Ethereum. And they recently announced a pledge to commit 2.5% of their to uh, total token supply to um, a Gitcoin aqueduct. Head over to tallyho.cash to try the Tallyho Community Edition and play around with its features before its upcoming ver version 1 and DAO launch. So Stani, it's uh, super good to have you back on. You've actually been on before uh, during ECC at the very beginning of uh, the COVID ep epidemic. Um, so that was just over two years ago. Yeah, that was, uh, I, I can't believe how much time has passed since then. Was it two or three years ago even? It was, it was two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, that, that's basically, it. so two years ago, that means uh, in DeFi, uh, 20 years. At because least 20 one, years. One year in, in uh, real life is uh, 20 years in DeFi. So many things happen, happen so quickly all the time. So... <laughs> <laughs> 20 this years is ago. true. And uh, this is particularly true today. So today we're recording this May 12th, 2022. So we are about um, two days into the collapse of the stable coin project Terra. Um, so it's collapsed from a $40 billion market cap um, by 99%. And uh, as we speak, the chain was halted a few hours ago. And this is very much not my usual MO. I don't really talk about recent events, especially not in the beginning of the episode. But um, I think this is this is one of these ecosystem moments. It's kind of like Mount Gox and uh, the Dow. It's kind of <laughs> it, it. It. I'm pretty sure this is gonna um, haunt us <laughs> for a while. So um, let's let's talk about this now. So. 
if if you think about lending markets um like Arven compound um especially a while ago they kind of they used to be stable coin kingmakers right so i mean why am i saying that so basically if you look um at the of at the stable coin demand a large fraction of that was fostered through rewards disbursed to liquidity providers um in the form of the native governance tokens um and basically which pools got rewarded was a protocol decision so and traditionally the stable coin stable coin uh, pools were highly rewarded um driving demand um for the corresponding stable coins so <laughs> super long lead up to my first question um what's your take on stable coins and stable coin mechanisms and how has it evolved over the years that's a very very good starter uh, <laughs> right there i i i definitely think um yeah what what, what happened with uh the uh usd and terra i i definitely think that the the uh mechanism there was uh pretty much kind of like an algorithmic design um and i think there was a lot of reliance on on market forces uh and the community and a wider um kind of like a crypto community I trust uh that uh, the, the the functionality and and mechanism of that stablecoin basically is is something that forks and holds the the peg so what what, what actually holds the peg is isn't uh actually the 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 mechanisms it's the our perception of those mechanisms and uh the uh USD stablecoin uh that their uh, community had uh th there um what was some interesting elements first of all uh you had this kind of like a burning um uh, minting mechanism between luna and the USD but at the same time they started to collateralize um partially the the stablecoin and and build trust so it, it's it's a perception it's the same thing for example with USD T uh, from Tether, where uh, we have a stable point that everyone has been trusting for years, um, and they have issues previously in terms of transparency and whatever, but still it's been trading at the one dollar range, and and because of the perception, so that's the thing, like how and what kind of mechanism you you trust, but also like uh, I've been. Uh, in DeFi now, so, I think six years when when we didn't have the even term DeFi wasn't really actually coined yet, so it was very early. We had one uh, decentralized exchange, Ether Delta, and uh, August very first uh, protocol. Uh, Ethland was was uh, probably second or third like financial uh, decentralized financial nature in in nature application. Then we start to see like more the uh, ecosystem to grow, but like even in our first version, we didn't have any stable coins. Just to give some history for for the audience, is that uh, the main stable coin tether uh, was on Omni chain, uh, which isn't even Bitcoin. So uh, centralized exchanges were supporting USD, and and they were integrating with the Omni chain. And later, uh, then we started to have like uh, stable coins in in the Ethereum network and across other new networks that, that were uh, picking up traction. But to, to give an example, uh, in the very beginning, you could actually borrow, um, for example, uh, Ether that was pegged to USD value. So you could come to Aave, deposit uh, different kinds of tokens, uh, and then borrow, uh, let's say, 100 USD worth of Ethereum, and then come later back and return 100 USD worth of Ethereum. And this was tricky because uh, your debt uh, has will be USD nominated, uh, but it means that if you want to use that uh, value, you need to convert it to real uh, USD quite soon because of the volatility so of, of, of Ethereum. So stable coins that are you know that you have a you have an asset that you know that it's you know pegged to one USD, um, let's say one die one USD. Uh, it really simplifies the uh, usability on blockchain. So you actually have value that you can just hold, store, and it doesn't fluctuate much. And that gives you a lot of uh, uh, usability and, and you can build a lot of applications on top. And uh, down the line, um, 
after first stable coins were created, the next thing what happened was the interest rate market. So essentially the Aave protocol um, is an example where you supply cryptographic assets and uh, for example, mainly stable coins uh, and you earn yield. And because the liquidity has been uh, very narrow in decentralized finance over the years, uh, especially in the beginning, you could uh, easily receive four to five to 6% yield uh, without any kind of like a liquidity mining in, in native uh, protocol tokens. That's very attractive uh, value proposition for uh, every single person who is looking at their checking account uh, or a savings account that doesn't offer them almost like uh, dust. That, that's just a kind of like a backstory. Uh, and and I, I think like when it comes to different stablecoin solutions and, and mechanisms, uh, there are different kinds of, right? So there is the very first model that uh, USD, USDT and, and USDC had uh, where you have the one-on-one collateralization. So effectively uh, you have a promise where, where you have a equal amount of funds either in bank account as cash or in some other uh, instrument that, that are uh, highly, li- highly liquid and, and low risk. Uh, then we have the next model where we have over globalization. So let's say that uh, you deposit a certain amount of uh, um, uh, cryptographic value, let's say in Ethereum, uh, and then you mint a stable coin uh, uh, against that uh, collateral, but less, less of the amount that you actually deposit. So you have over globalization, and if the value of that collateral uh, declines, uh, and and below the value that you the stablecoin has been issued and and uh, for that user uh, there is liquidation so so there is a mechanism to uphold the the colonization value within the whole protocol so it 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 technically shouldn't go below that and and looking at how the liquidations works so so, so once um, it's not very capital efficient when you have a stablecoin where you have over colonization um, so. This has sparked a lot of discussions, like how to make a stable coin where you introduce the, the collateralization and you basically have some sort of an algorithm that is backing or using market forces or um, using something else than, than collateralizing fully the, the, the position. And this is how, what many of these uh, so-called algorithmic stable coins have been uh, trying to kind of like a solve. And I think it's a very valuable and interesting problem to solve because if you think about it, uh, uh, US dollar, it doesn't have, uh, so it does have this technical redeemability, but it isn't backed by any kind of like a, a direct value. It's backed indirectly by the US economy. Uh, and of course, the ability of the US economy to collect taxes, running infrastructure, and, and all this bunch of uh, economical uh, features. So essentially, um, if this can happen in real life, uh, how you can make it work um, in same or similar manner uh, in decentralized finance and reduce that polarization requirement, which allows you to scale because you're not relying on those different kind of uh, assets. And this is how we've seen various experimentations. The thing is that crypto is volatile and everyone who most, most of the uh, participants were in this space, they are risk takers, they make quick decisions. So, uh, this it's just very hard to do in a very small uh, scale. And I think that's where, um, for example, the USD Terra uh, stablecoin had uh, become is- issues. I mean, if, if for time being, if the market has been uh, bullish over a uh, long period of time and continue to grow, maybe we will not have seen this issue uh, yet, but it's, it's still very fascinating to see as an experimentation, but also what is uh, difficult here is that many fo- folks that actually believed in that stable coin, uh, they really believed in the fact that it keeps the peg and they uh, were confident on that as a user, even though the, the time of, of uh, from the inception is very short. So it just shows also the fact that uh, one thing I want to say is that in, in decentralized finance and in open ecosystem uh, like like the Web3, anyone can come and, and just build new things and innovate and uh, 
look at uh, the code bases and improve them to redeploy. That's the beauty of uh, you know scaling and, and accelerating innovation and solving problems and making impact. Uh, but also it means that um, there are sort of people that are looking what you're doing and if it's interesting and gets attention, they will come and, and interact with that smart contract or a stable point or whatever the application is. And, and if it's not actually uh, well designed or the market isn't ready for that kind of a, uh, idea, then the problem starts. I kind of want to push back a little bit here. So this narrative that um, the US dollar is not backed by anything, I think this is a narrative that we hear often um, on crypto Twitter and in this ecosystem generally. And I think it's a narrative um, that is at the very least omitting a large part of the truth. So if you look at um, the entire dollar ecosystem, The, mat the, fa the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of dollars are actually backed by something. Um, basically, so basically dollars are, are created. So basically someone goes to the bank and says, I need a loan to buy a house. For Bonds, for example. Um, yeah. Yeah. So basically, and I mean, this is, this is how almost all of the dollars are created um, as, at, at, in, as part of loans and mortgages and i mean and then they they are collateralized um not by things that are super easily liquidated um so things like houses for instance or cars or i mean or even just personal reputation if i if i get a credit card loan um but it is it is actually backed by some real value so i i am not i am not sure whether um, a purely algorithmic stablecoin can ever work <laughs> you you touch a very good point because that's how essentially most of the money is created when someone is taking a, a bank loan and at that point uh the bank is assessing credit uh credit worthiness and and, and basically creates that uh value so so essentially when you get a uh, get a funding to buy a house for example at that point the funds are created and 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 the the Uh, person is paying interest on that, and it, it, it's actually quite interesting because it means that every single single uh, uh, dollar that is, or a pound, or a euro that is actually out there, someone is paying interest on that. So it, the, the the kind of like I think the backing is an interesting concept because you can it can be very concrete, or you can think of uh, uh, about it in, in very widely. So. In this case, when you buy, for example, a house, you can think about it. Are you actually is is the house actually backing the loan and and the currency, or is it back is it backed by your credit worthiness, or is it backed by the fact that um, it has it, it has demand? So if you are not able to repay your loan, there's someone who is willing to buy it and repay to your loan. So All of these tie into each other, right? So basically, exactly. I mean, with, with the, the the majority of people with um, uh, day jobs, if they go to the bank and say, um, "Can I get a, a loan for eight hundred thousand dollars, for instance?" Um, and and the the bank asks, "What do you need it for?" And the person says, "Oh, I want to buy a house here, um, and uh, basically it, its value is a million, um, and uh, and basically I have two hundred thousand as a down payment." Um, then uh, the bank's uh, answer is going to look very different as if that person walked into the bank and says, "Can I can I loan eight hundred thousand?" And the bank asks, "What do you want to do for it? Uh, do with it?" And the person And says, "Oh, I don't know yet, but I'm definitely cre credit worthy because I, I, I have a job, right?" So, I mean, it, I, I think, um, I mean, yeah, sure. Obvi obviously, it ties in with the fact that um, that the house has a market value, um, and generally, real estate is more. I mean, not super stable, but I mean, it's it's uh, stabler than many other assets. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think the, these things are not mutually exclusive, right? And I think they're not mutually exclusive, but also it's kind of like it's also like if if you go down deeper, uh, you can even think of like, am I actually is it actually backed by by the house by my credit worthiness uh, or by my personal 
equity uh, in, in that sense. So when you look at the, the algorithmic stable coins, uh, essentially when where you can uh, mint a uh, lot of kind of like a native equity token or asset and, and backed by that, like are you actually using the, the protocol as a collateral? So I definitely agree, like it's not completely um, mutually exclusive. Uh, and that's why kind of like a credit and, and, and collateralization is very uh, hard topic. In crypto, it's very like we we have a very um, kind of like a uh, heterogenic approach in the sense that you know if it's if it's not traded on exchanges, you know like how can you use it as a collateral? You know, you, same for example NFTs. Like if you have NFTs, like how we can use them as a collateral because they don't have the market price, but they have value. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of like a difficulties when it comes to. Uh, collateralization and, and, and backing. Exactly. So, but here the problem is not collateralization as such, it's the price oracle, right? So basically getting getting a price feed. And this is also one of the attack vectors for, for lending markets, um, kind of manipulating the price oracle. But we'll get to that later. So basically let, let, let's kind of, let's loop back to, to, to stablecoins. So basically if you think about different stablecoin designs, so as you said, there's the ones where the stablecoin is actually backed um, by some sort of fiat value. So basically, um, a good example would be USDC or uh, USDT if if everything is as Bitfinex says. Um, and then there are stablecoins that are backed by um, on-chain values um, such as uh, DAI and uh, and RAI. Um, and uh, that, then uh, there are algorithmic stablecoins that are either not backed at all, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, UST um, or fractionally backed li like like frax for instance right so um, and for for a long time the Achilles heel of lending markets in terms of uh, from a security perspective um, was um, that you needed to make sure that every single asset that you accept every single kind of collateral by itself um, is one hundred percent trustworthy. <laughs> and not manipulable um so this has kind of this has changed with with um, the most recent version of Aave. um but um maybe maybe let's let's talk about um what the um what what an attack or doesn't even need to be a, an attack what um the vulnerability would have looked like say for instance um you would have had um uh, a centralized stablecoin emitter um, go haywire and just print an endless supply of whatever stablecoin um, they issued um, uh, that was accepted as a collateral on Aave. So basically the question is, for, for a long time, the main Achilles heel of lending markets such as Aave was that, um, that uh, collateral uh, different types of collateral weren't shielded against one another, right? So basically, if you if one of the collaterals kind of had a catastrophic failure and the value would go to zero, um, that would impact the entire lending market. Yeah, exactly. So uh, essentially, that's how we we were building um, protocols that you have the pooled collateral composition, uh, meaning that uh, normally, for example, that when you come to the uh, to the other protocol as a user, you can uh, supply cryptographic assets. So typically you might have a portfolio of assets. So you might have a bit of EATS, you might have a bit of Aave, you might have a bit of, let's say, Uni, um, and then you supply them. Uh, and then uh, what happens is that you can draw stable coins or any other asset that you, you, you want to. And uh, in that case, uh, if one of those assets for some reason um, goes down, uh, it, it affects the whole uh, kind of like a lending market. But with uh, the, the version uh, 3 of the other protocol, uh, what we wanted to do is that we, first of all, we, first of all, in version 3, we focused quite a lot uh, on, on two topics. Um, one was the uh, security and, and risk mitigation. And the second topic uh, pretty much was the topic of capital efficiency. So in terms of like risk mitigation, um, one of the main features that we added, uh, of course, we added also like supply caps, uh, borrow caps. So essentially each and every single asset can be capped. So you can list 
uh, assets more quicker, but then with a smaller uh, supply cap. But the interesting feature is uh, the so-called um, isolation mode where we silo a collateral away from the other collaterals. So what it, what it means is that you can come into the uh, other protocol uh, and supply one particular asset that is listed as isolation mode uh, with a lower cap on top of that if, if needed. Uh, and usually there is, is a cap. Um, then you can borrow uh, stable points against that particular uh, asset. So the idea of what we are trying to solve here is that uh, because there's the space is moving very quickly, uh, but there's many asset uh, listing requests um, from the community members. And it's very important that uh, we take always as a community uh, the risk aspect uh, quite, quite involved. And, and this allows to scale and list more uh, assets uh, more quicker without introducing this unlimited or uh, unknown risk into the um, other protocol. So essentially, it's, it helps to scale the protocol, but also mitigate uh, risk in, in that sense. And I definitely agree, like, um, this kind of like an infinite mint has, has, has its own issue, but also with, in terms of stable points, uh, centralized stable points like USDT uh, and USDC, you will always pretty much have the issue of you are not necessarily knowing what is the um, or how the underlying assets are collateralized and to what extent. Uh, but maybe the future is where uh, you know you might have a stable point that is trusted enough and they might start reducing collateralization. But then the, the, the problem is always the perception of the, the, the public. So let's say that uh, we can easily trust uh, USDT uh, in case when the market is fine. But then when the market is actually taking a hit and valuations are decreasing and there's sort of panic, that is the moment where the actual real uh, stress test will happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and basically, um, being being able to kind of uh, list um, assets with a lower um, with a lower threshold for security, um, this has kind of gone hand in hand with um, our governance, right? So basically, um, th the other thing that has been upgraded majorly um, is uh, is the governance mechanism behind our. Tell us about that. Yeah. So essentially, what we have uh, in the version three of the other protocol. So we try to think of uh, uh, different kinds of ways of minimizing uh, governance as well. Because governance is also it's it's a way of uh, uh, coordinating effectively uh, in a decentralized way and 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 innovating and improving the protocol, making important decisions and uh, implementing them, but at the same time uh, getting all the all the decision making into the main governance is something that is very uh, burdensome process. I mean, we had recently uh, over the past. A um, couple of weeks, multiple votes, and each vote requires a uh, decent amount of quorum. And uh, this slows down uh, some simple um, uh, governance updates, such as risk parameter updates, which just needs like small tweaking uh, periodically. So we added uh, this so called risk admin feature uh, into the uh, lending pools, meaning that you can actually. Uh, delegate that function to an external smart contract that might have uh, various different kinds of logics. So it might have a logic that, you know, you can uh, tweak the risk parameters up to certain thresholds uh, between certain certain kind of like a threshold. And, and then um, you could um, essentially create additional logic there that you can trust someone like Gauntlet uh, to do those changes and submit them even like a daily basis uh, with a, based on some sort of uh, machine learning algorithm, or you can add some sort of uh, staking uh, functionality where staking more Aave or staked Aave will increase the loan to value ratios. Like the options are quite open and there is like room to build those things. So that's the, the kind of like a main thing in terms of like uh, being able to uh, tweak the uh, risk parameters. And then of course we have the, we, we 
made similar kind of like a uh, governance update in the uh, part of uh, listing uh, where we created this listing admins where similarly logic can be delegated to another smart contract uh, and, and create some sort of staking or uh, just delegate it, 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 the, the listing into a smaller quorum or even like a bigger quorum. Like that's, that's the idea of uh, governance that it needs to be uh, uh, flexible as well. And uh, speaking of governance, it's something that we all have been always innovating. So we, uh, since our Aave governance launch, uh, we innovated quite a lot what was, uh, what is currently used in the DeFi ecosystem because it's very typical to delegate voting. Uh, the Aave governance supports actually uh, separate vote delegation and uh, proposition power delegation. So you can delegate proposition power to a uh, developer who creates a proposal and then just to a pro uh, protocol politician the uh, the uh, voting power to vote on, on, on decisions. And from that, we also innovated uh, to create cross-chain governance as well between uh, different networks that we have. So there is uh, there is sort of innovation on, on, on that side. And I think it's still... Uh, where we're going to improve uh, more. So kind of like the now the focus point is actually in uh, ensuring that we have uh, governance where you can vote in low cost um, and, and something like Snapshot might be an interesting solution and optimistic voting as well. Cool. There's, there's two things that I kind of want to loop in here. Maybe the first the first thing is uh, you, you just mentioned protocol politicians. So, I mean, this is kind of what we've seen um, increasingly over the last couple of months. Basically, people who um, are active in a number of DeFi protocols and act as, uh, as delegates for voting. Um, how, how do you see the increasing profes professionalization in the governance of DeFi protocols? Do you think this is a good thing or do you think this is something where th that's that's um, a symptom of governance that's not quite there yet for the user? It's very early. So for me, um, uh, when I look at the other governance, uh, I see a lot of delegation. So... Uh, there's sort of uh, governance power uh, and voting power delegated to uh, university blockchain associations. So uh, Berkeley, Stanford, uh, you know, all these universities, they, they actually, they contribute into decentralized finance and Web3 protocols and, and actively vote, uh, which is amazing because uh, student networks and, and those are ways to also kind of like uh, to delegate, to decentralized to be able to decentralize an ecosystem. And it goes back to the like early days of the internet where universities were the ones who were connecting uh, and, and creating connectivity within computer networks. So for me, that's that's been very fascinating progress. Um, we could see more, actually more active um, uh, like uh, uh, governance activity, but I think the, the, the issue at the moment is uh, the fact that you, uh, you need to pay very high gas fees when you vote on, on Ethereum, but that might change on layer two. So of course, that will be a different story. And 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 eventually, uh, one, one another thing is that there's also this kind of idea of lending votes out. And I think that's, that's a kind of a thing that is very um, concerning to me because, uh, you know, the idea of, of uh, that you can actually borrow, let's say, uh, certain amount of a quorum and just vote with with uh two thousand dollars is 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 frightening uh, idea yeah i mean this is something that have has been i mean basically the idea of vote buying and dark DAOs, and this has been around forever and i mean even in 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 the curve was governance i mean it's 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 happening right so what do you think we need to look out for in order to kind of retain a healthy governance? I think like or, or, or organic voting is important so that that, that the, the voting behavior, you know, corresponds of the intent of the community. So the discussions that have been in the, the community forums and um, that there, there's kind of like a, the, the voting, the snapshot signaling, and then the actual on-chain voting corresponds what has been discussed. So there, there's like, you shouldn't see like surprises last minute on chain. Uh, but um, 
I, I, I kind of uh, feel that with the um, curve wars is, is that some of the voting behavior that can be done without actually governance, you know, just some sort of staking and, and so forth. That's, that's like one thing. And it, then it's also happening in most of the, this kind of like a token economics. So you, you vote um, there, but like, uh, in, in my opinion, the most challenging part is uh, being able to kind of like a bribe, uh, get voting power, and then using that to to achieve your own uh, kind of a goal. And then you are not like necessarily looking for a consensus, what you have in the community. Because if you think about the idea of uh, uh, consensus and uh, how it works is that in Web3 communities, uh, you usually try to achieve as wide consensus as possible. Uh, so these, the solutions and implementations should look like more of a compromise that everyone is kind of satisfied because you want to um, you want to you want to make everyone happy uh, as, as, as many people as possible happy because there's always a risk that the community a part of the community members they can actually fork the protocol and create a new community and and create a risk of kind of like a forking but forking should happen as well so it's it's a organic behaviors creating new communities and and new ideas so, it's, but it's still very early to say where and which direction things are going to go. I would love to see more like innovation regarding the experience uh, of voting and especially regarding um, increasing the vote participation. So kind of like many people don't care about to vote, but if it can be made very simple uh, and elegantly and brought up to the users closely, that will help to increase the vote participation because that's that's what decentralization is that you can participate. I totally get that. Um, I feel a part of the problem is that it's so much work to keep up, right? I mean, I'm 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 a full time Web three person. I can't keep up. It's like it's not because I'm a slow reader. It's just because there's so much going on. So basically, you kind of to to kind of know what happens in the governance of all the protocols you kind of partake in. I mean, basically keeping up with like Maker and Uni and Ava and, uh, and Compound and, you know, all of these different things takes a lot of time and there's a lot of votes. Um, so do, do you, have you guys thought about disincentivizing not voting? So basically things like people who don't vote, they're diluted? in terms of governance token so maybe 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 they shouldn't hold a governance token have you thought about kind of divorcing the idea of um uh, having this fee accrual token um from the idea of having a separate governance token because currently it's everything is kind of oh i mean governance and ownership is always kind of amalgamated into one do, do you think that's sustainable yeah, I, I think this uh, is incentivizing the the voting is is quite tricky because you are you know touching the the holders assets and you because like when you have a governance token you have like the governance power uh, and then there's like certain things attached which is voting or something else and um, for for me it's kind of like a tricky idea uh, to implement and I would rather uh see kind of like innovation where uh, we try to incentivize voting and also incentivize active uh, uh, participation in the governance or in the community. But that's the same thing, right? So I mean basically given, giving extra tokens to people who vote and uh, kind of uh, uh, slashing people who don't vote is effectively the same thing. Yeah, I think it's just like kind of like uh, as optics, it's very hard to swallow for a kind of like a token holder uh, in the sense that you, some people just, you know, they don't want to vote. They just want to delegate their votes to to someone else. And, you know, that's that's fine because they want to trust uh, protocol politicians, for example. But, but delegating is not the, so we, basically people who delegate, they're not the problem, right? It's people who don't vote at all um, who are the problem, right? I, they're not a problem either because they, you know, they, there's different roles when you are part of a community. So when you, when you're holding an asset, you're you're basically also betting on that project, and you're 
uh, part of that community and, and you are, you're, you're supporting uh, the value of the community. And then there is the, the, the voting behavior. So I, I think, uh, I mean, voting always has a cost, right? So, you know, if, uh, if you vote online, it costs time, it might cost you uh, a computer or, uh, you know, a uh, bus ticket or a car ride to somewhere to vote and some time, whatever is the mechanism, same in on chain as well. So like there's definitely mechanisms of like that there's there's already kind of like challenges there to to go and vote because it's it's a it's it's costly for you and especially the problem is when you don't have like idea or time to go into the into the uh, pro- proposals and understand them very well it's very difficult to vote in that case in many cases these pro- these proposals are very technical and very difficult to understand. But I think when it comes to actually incentivizing, it's just very hard topic because you, you want to support the community, but you don't want to necessarily vote, but you want to have your assets as a whole. So the, as a conceptual idea, it's challenging. But what I think might be easier is that you could incentivize the voting by uh, inflation, which is kind of like the same thing, but optically and as a feeling uh, for a community member, it's different. But I'm more curious, not about that, but I'm curious about actually creating voting rights that aren't related to the governance token itself, because governance tokens, they have value. But for example, if you are an active community member or you care about the product, you care about the protocol, uh, in that case, uh, you could get a special right to vote uh, with a certain voting uh, power and 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 participate, and I think that might be more interesting because um, you know you are actually giving voting power for, for people who are active and and they follow what's going on and and that way kind of like bring more diverse governance. I think that could be uh, more interesting and something that optimism uh, team has been uh, also uh, working towards. Yeah, I, I think we could talk about this topic for hours. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I> but <laughs> there's there's one more thing I kind of I I I really want to cover, um, and that is interoperability and different layer ones. So Ava has deployed to a number of um, uh, layer ones, different from Ethereum, the original layer one for Ava. Um, how how has the community? Um, decided which um, which chains deploy on, and how do you think about um, interoperability across different um, chains for Aave? I mean, typically, kind of splitting liquidity is usually um, not not a great idea. So t- tell us how you go about this. Mm. So. Uh, it's quite simple to be honest. So there, there is a proposal. Someone proposes in the other governance forum that uh, you know there is this other network and it has a EDM, you know, and there's sort of traction and might be even part of that community that uh, proposal. Then the the other governance has a snapshot vote whether to deploy there, and and usually there might be some community member that is deploying the the contracts, which is relatively uh, straightforward um, uh, thing to do, well, uh, technically, uh, for technical people and with some smart contract experience, of course. And and <laughs> and essentially, usually the idea is that um, when you look at the other community, it's very uh, inclusive community. So it listed assets that weren't listed in other lending protocols in very early, but with very conservative uh, risk parameters uh, deployed as a first protocol, like big protocol into Polygon and into Avalanche and, and kind of like, it's been always kind of like a uh, inclusive community in, in that sense. And I think like every single community uh, is uh, also a reach into new audience. And and I think that's the, the kind of like a key momentum because Ethereum also is, is quite uh, heavy on transaction costs. So if you are joining, the Web3 community, you might be joining elsewhere through Polygon or Avalanche or Optimism or Arbitrum with, with the, the, the layer twos. So that's like given. So there is communities in, in different networks and the challenge is actually 
uh, moving funds between those networks. And that's where the trickiest part comes because uh, the, what, when you move funds, you are using a so-called bridge. And, and that means where you actually uh, move into a, a kind of like a scenario where it's very difficult to secure uh, that bridging functionality. And that's where I think the, the current Achilles heel is. But what, what we can do instead of uh, focusing on bridging assets between one network to another, uh, one layer one to another layer one, uh, focus on building functionality uh, for the layer twos because the layer twos are inheriting the security of uh, layer one. And that's where, that's where in my opinion, the, the, the future is because you can transact in relatively low uh, transaction costs on, on layer two, but then you are um, submitting the state of the layer two periodically into Ethereum, for example, and you get the, the, the security that, that you uh, need. So I think that's where, where we are going towards. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, so in terms of um, Ava, um, I think I've covered most of my questions, but because Ava apparently was not enough, you launched a new protocol um, named Lens. Um, tell us about Lens, what, what it does. Lens protocol is essentially a decentralized social graph. Um, and what it means is that uh, you can create an on-chain profile Uh, and, and basically follow other profiles. And both the on-chain profile is tokenized as NFT and the follow relationships are tokenized as NFTs as well. So um, uh, for example, um, if I have a uh, your follower NFT, so I followed you and I'm, I can be the token uh, ID uh, one, so I'm your biggest uh, fan at that point. Um, When you have, let's say, 1,000 uh, followers and you publish content um, on, on the Lens protocol, what happens is that that content is uh, dynamically re represented in the uh, follow NFTs, meaning if I'm looking at your follow NFT in my wallet or OpenSea, I always see your latest content. So essentially, we created this uh, way of dynamically distribute content between you and your audience. Um, and, and have that social uh, relationship. And then, of course, if I like your content and I can actually uh, uh, mint a immutable copy of that content, so I can mint an NFT as any other that is immutable. And essentially, what we're trying to solve here is that, uh, for example, if you create uh, a account in Twitter, you have uh, 100,000 followers. Uh, you know, if those followers are locked into that platform, so Pretty much the platform controls, you know, how your audience will interact with you, the features that they're, they're going to be adding, um, how much those features or algorithms will help you. So you are at the mer mercy of that uh, platform, whatever that platform is. So Lens Protocol, the idea is that instead of uh, your profile being just a number in a database of a social media platform, uh, it's actually on chain, meaning that you have... Uh, you have the control of your profile and, and your uh, audience, your followers, the, the, the uh, uh, distribution of, of the content. And essentially, if any, anyone can come and build a social media application on top of the Lens protocol. And, and this means that every single user that comes to those different applications are growth hacking the same uh, social uh, graph. And the applications can decide how they curate Uh, the content, the data, moderate, and, and, and so forth. But essentially, you have the key uh, infrastructure yourself. Super interesting. So if you think about other decentralized networks um, that have been around, so Steam, BitCloud, DSO, whatever it's called now, um, Mastodon, and so on, none of these have gathered any serious traction. Um, so what did they get wrong? I think there's a lot of things there. I, I mean, essentially, like, there's been social media networks uh, before uh, Twitter, before uh, Facebook, uh, and even, like, the, there's social media networks even that uh, started early and 
got a lot of traction and and pretty much died later like myspace for example uh if you go today to myspace and try the application it barely works uh, and the company even uh that bought it latest they informed that uh you know they because of a server migration uh they lost uh all the user data before 2015 if i remember uh, correctly so this is just showcases like first of all why you need to own your profile and 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 the uh, connectivity with your followers uh but the reason in my opinion with with uh, the models like steam it's um uh, and a bit cloud is that they focus on uh the kind of like a value part so for example that you have a profile you have value uh you know you have a uh, let's say that you have a a post and and you know there's token economics that if you like the post you you basically have some sort of monetization and and I, I think what we are doing with lens protocol is uh it hasn't any relation to that it's completely different thing so where we are actually focusing on the ownership act aspect so we think that if you uh if you own your key you own your coupon you own your crypto, you own your access to various DeFi protocols, you should also have uh, ownership on your profile and, and the audience and, and basically distribute your content to um, kind of like a Web3 uh, on-chain ecosystem. And I think that the important point to see here is that building a social network itself is very hard. So we saw with Clubhouse how much effort it takes where all the VCs were pushing a lot of effort to to actually break uh, break through the, the the network effects, and uh, uh, this creates very big uh, barrier for many. Uh, but for example, if you as a developer, you don't need to focus on the network effects, but you can actually come create a completely new innovative way to interact with content. Uh, the next thing you know, you might get traction uh, because you created something new or you create amazing, cool, interesting algorithm. So it just showcases like how uh, different approach we have from what we've seen before. And I think I observed that so, like these centralized networks, they don't need to grow very fast. So normally you have to build a good social media application in two to three years if it doesn't get traction. You start to, you need to start thinking something or pivoting to something else. Um, in Web3, networks can grow slowly. Good examples is ENS, you know, Ethereum name service started as, as basically uh, having your Ethereum name, there's utility, and, and now you know there is uh, quite a vast amount of uh, ENS names uh, to date, but it started from very small. POPs is a good example, uh, you know, where uh, you have one person, uh, Patricio, going to uh, events in, in different um, hackathons, DEF CON, and so forth, and giving uh, proof of attestation badges. And essentially, over the time, it actually grown to a, a, a kind of like a habit to many people in, in Web3 and, and continues to grow. So it just show, shows that if you build something very valuable uh, and something that um, is useful, ENS is useful because you can send funds to to a more simple address. Lens is useful because you can create your profile, have followings, and uh, no one can take that um, away from you. And you, if you create a big brand, you can even transfer that uh, profile NFT to, to someone else. Uh, so it just showcases that there's sort of, a lot of goals to, to actually the building, but also that you create uh, utility. And we've seen already, uh, we had a uh, LF Grove hackathon uh, together with it Global. We had over 530 hackers with 130 submissions, uh, which was like unexpected for us uh, a few weeks after the testnet, testnet launch. So it just shows that there's so many developers out there that are just eager uh, to, to build something new uh, in, in the social media space. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is uh, true hands down. And I think, uh, I mean, Twitter is uh, many people's favorite pet peeve, right? I mean, basically how how, how it displays um, the 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 different tweets and which order it shows them to you in, and how badly searchable it is. And uh, um, so you you actually 
uh, pulled a social media stunt uh, on Twitter uh, a week or two ago, um, where you got banned supposedly for writing that you were the Twitter interim CEO and uh, you have implemented the edit button. And uh, um, yeah, so supposedly uh, Twitter banned you for, for that and you made it onto Bloomberg. So t t t give, us, give us the download. How did you really get banned? Yeah, so that's the thing, because like uh, there was sort of narrative about uh, Elon Musk buying uh, Twitter and, and, and making it private. So essentially, that means there's sort of freedom to do uh, whatever you want to do. And also at the same time, he was talking quite a lot about the freedom of speech narrative, uh, you know, and, and also kind of like uh, he's known to post a lot of jokes in, in Twitter. Uh, I mean, I, I found that very funny. And I found it very funny to actually tweet that, uh, well, now then I'm the uh, new interim CEO of Twitter <laughs> and people started to kind of laugh about it. And then I also uh, made a, a tweet about uh, setting up a 90 day roadmap for Twitter, including shipping the um, edit button next week, uh, integrating with uh, supporting uh, Ethereum and ENS, uh, integrating with Lens protocol and, and, and so forth. So. Essentially, I think I went to sleep, and when I woke up in the morning, uh, I, I heard from my partner that uh, I'm, I'm banned from from Twitter, and and uh, and there was like a big free stunning hashtag free stunning movement going on. And uh, I think after a day, uh, I got back into Twitter, and then I was joking that I'm, I'm back as interim CEO of Twitter. And I think it's a good example of you know kind of like. You know, testing the waters, but also like how, like how the algorithms work, who decides, who gets banned, you know, and and what happens. Because for me, Twitter was the uh, only like public facing uh, social media that I'm, I'm using. That's where all my audience is. Because like if I lose that connectivity with my audience, I lose my voice essentially. Um, so that was very scary, uh, but also like gave a lot of um, ideas how and why why it's so important to build decentralized social. What should Twitter become? I mean, should they adopt Lend? I mean, if, 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 you, were, if you were to... That's to, to, easy. <laughs> they should become a front end from, for the Lens protocol because it's, it's, uh, it's in powers. But I mean, we're not there yet. I mean, Lens protocol is just, it's been on testnet, it's going to mainnet and Probably it's in mainnet maybe when this goes live. Who knows? But like uh <laughs> this goes live to live tomorrow, so I I doubt it. Yeah, but, okay, uh... good, good, good. <laughs> unless unless we make some magic. So uh but uh I think it's also like we want to experience how how this goes and, and see what kind of uh you know what kind of uh feedback we get. You know, if it works, I hope that you know the future of social is built on top of lens. Um, and 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 has an element of blockchain, so that's my uh, that's my kind of like a mission. As as a heavy Twitter user, do you think Twitter under Elon is going to become better than it currently is? Better. The question is better for who? Because you know, essentially, Twitter is a company. They need to make profit. Uh, they need to have algorithms that just basically find ways to. Uh, basically get value from the users. Um, so the users are the product there. Uh, there are people who are willing to pay for, uh, for utility, but uh, it's, really, it's really hard to tell. I personally think he could build a better Twitter, better product, but also it takes time to, to uh, get things through with an organization that big. What do you think of um, Twitter's open source initiative, Blue Sky? I think it's an interesting also approach. Uh, it's quite different. It's more federated uh, and it's more of like they believe in an approach where, you know, you could have namespace in, uh, in, in blockchain, but we believe that you can have way more. I mean, we, we approach the, the uh, social media from the perspective of uh, decentralization and how we've, we've, uh, we've been always native smart contract builders. So that's what we, uh, we, we are betting on. Um, but also, I, I think um, I would love to see some more tangible uh, initiatives and experimentation from them. And I think there's so many 
topics to solve in in the in, in these in social and social media in general. So uh, from moderation, uh, monetization, and so forth. So like we we need more people in the space to build things. If you if you look at your day, I mean your day, I assume like mine only has twenty four hours. So how 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 are you going to split your time between Ava and Lens Protocol, or are there synergies even? There are synergies, but I I, I, sp I pretty much spend uh, half of time in in the the, the other related things and half in in lens. But it really depends. We have a great team. Uh, there's almost 100 people working at at Aave and and the team. And um, you know, it's it's not the only things we're working upon. So there's sort of things we're we're planning and and building and researching. So it's it's more about. Uh, I mean, at all of it, the, the, the actual product is the organization. So, um, yeah, so it is, I, I think I'm not worried about my time that much uh, as far as I get like a couple of days a year off. What's on the roadmap for both Lens and Aave? And I mean, basically, uh, may maybe let's uh, set two years as the time horizon here, because when you extra extrapolate from past data, this is when we'll have you on again. So... Uh... I think we're, we're going to be doing the same thing. So we're going to build uh, Web3 infrastructure, product services, and, and so forth. But like, what we want to achieve is that whatever we do, move the space forward uh, as, as fast as possible. Because I think decentralization and Web3 can build, build, bring a lot of impact to uh, all the users. Uh, so definitely, like that's where I think space is going. So if if we are able to be one of the builders in the space and contribute a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure, then we're in the right, uh, right place. Looking back on the last couple of days, we have seen again that um, this ecosystem, um, there's never a boring day, right? So basically things always or often turn out different than you think they will. Um, but if, if you would make a prediction for the rest of this year, what, what do you think... Um, What's what do you think the major trend is going to be for, for not not just for Lens and uh, and Ava but for the wider ecosystem? In terms of like the trends, uh, I think definitely uh, obviously Web three social is something we I think is a big trend and it's coming because naturally, especially with the discussion about uh, social media moderation and and the issues with the um, Web three platforms, that's going to be like a big big trend. I also think the layer twos is is very important infrastructure. So layer twos, um, you know, they they allow scalability, and there is where we see uh, new applications being, being built. If I'm pressing you now for for one um, prediction of something that people generally do not expect in the ecosystem for layer twos um, and how that's going to go until the end of the year. Do you have do you have something you you would want to venture here? <laughs> I don't know if I want to say anything to get trouble later. Uh, I would say there's going to be more users than now. Okay. At least Hopefully. more addresses generated, more addresses generated in Web three. Yeah, I think uh, I think this this is a pretty safe uh, prediction. Yeah. At least I hope. I, yeah, I don't want to promise that uh, Luna will get back to peg. Uh, sorry, the USD get, gets back to peg or anything like that. So I, I think I, I'm going to go with a safe bet. <laughs> cool. Thank you for coming on, Stani. This was uh, uh, this was very illuminating. Thank you so much. It was very very good. Thanks, Vidivike.